Um, okay, then, then I would say we start with this session. Yes, if you agree with this, then I would uh, open <laughs> open the, this 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 panel and with this also this conference uh, with official uh, welcome words. Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear distinguished participants and guests. My name is Andreas Bielig from the German Economy Research Department of the Warsaw School of Economics. I have the pleasure to cordially welcome you here at our annual conference. This conference is in 2021 organized under the title Quo Vadis European Union of 27, the European Union between internal tensions, COVID crisis and external challenges, Polish and German perspectives. Our conference is organized in cooperation also with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Poland. So we would like also to thank the foundation and all involved persons for valuable support of, to realize our event. In our panel, we meet today to present new insights from research practice and policy about major challenges from the emergence of artificial intelligence for our European societies. Since the term artificial intelligence was minted in 1956 at the Dartmouth conference, we had to wait long decades for a broader dissemination of scientific, technological, and especially economic knowledge in our societies. Finally, in the last years, uh, with increasing market power of new internet businesses, products and services, but also organizational processes uh, using um, elements of artificial intelligence became known for nearly everyone. So today usage and applications of artificial intelligence are discussed intensively, but also controversially in our societies. To discuss major aspects of artificial intelligence and their economic impacts on our European societies, we arrange today's discussion with outstanding experts from policy, science and practice. We would like to welcome Mr. Oettinger. I hope he is joining us uh, later during the session. Former European Union Commissioner for Digital, uh, for Digital Economy and Society. The second person in the panel and uh, second panelist is Dr. Christian Roscher, Senior Economist for Industrial Organization and Competition at the German Economy Institute in Cologne. Hello, Dr. Roscher. We have seen us. Hello. The third panelist is Mr. Eduard Singer from the German Federal Artificial Intelligence Association. He is also CEO, if I understood it correctly, and founder of Neusinger, Neusinger GmbH. Hello, Mr. Singer. Hello. Hello. Morning. The presentation of the discussion has Mr. Martin Antosiewicz, a journalist with focus on digitalization issues and academic teacher at the Vistula University. Hello, Good Mr. Afternoon. Antosiewicz. Hello. But before we uh, before we start with the discussion, we start uh, we have some welcome words. And for this, I would like to invite our officials from the Warsaw School of Economics and Konrad Adenauer Foundation to address some words of welcome. First, I would like to give the floor shortly to the vice rector of our Warsaw School of Economics, Professor Jacek Prokop. After this, the director of the World Economy Research Institute at the SGH, Professor Marzena Varesa, and the director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Poland, Mr. David Gregorz, take also the opportunity to welcome you. So first, please, um, our rector, Professor Kropov, you have the floor. Thank you very much. So it's my real pleasure and honor to, to welcome you at least online at Warsaw School of Economics. So I, I, I wish we could meet uh, uh, here physically, but unfortunately our plans to organize this entire conference here in, uh, on our campus uh, couldn't be fulfilled. Uh, but anyhow, I, I'm really happy that uh, this conference uh, can be uh, run, uh, at least uh, online. Uh, our school, our school is, is always a good platform and a good place for discussion about variety of uh, issues uh, that, that pertain our societies, uh, our economies uh, and also politics. So uh, clearly uh, European environment is, is very important to all of us. And I'm really happy that uh, we as 
uh, neighbors, geographical neighbors, right? Poland and Germany, that we can uh, undertake uh, considerations of, uh, of the challenges that uh, are really common to, to all of us. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, our, our joint efforts uh, will allow to, uh, to come, come down to some conclusions, to come down to some ideas that will help everybody to, uh, to make Europe a better world. Uh, our school, maybe just a couple of words for, for those of you who don't know our school, so for our guests. So, uh, so our school uh, this year celebrates 115 years uh, of existence. So, uh, so we, we are proud to be uh, the oldest, uh, but at the same time, the best uh, uh, university of business and economics uh, in Poland. Uh, so I, I mentioned I mentioned about our quality. So maybe one sign of our, of our quality, late, just uh, uh, that occurred just the last uh, couple of weeks, is the uh, the accreditation that we have obtained, uh, Equis accreditation, uh, as uh, one of the yeah, top business schools right in the world. Only 200 business schools or around 200 business schools in the world have this Equis accreditation. So uh, we are now proud. To have received uh, such uh, such an accreditation. So, uh, but anyhow, uh, yes, thank you, thank you for your recognition. So uh, the, we we still celebrate uh, this uh, uh, this achievement, and uh, and clearly uh, we hope uh, we hope that uh, the quality of our teachers, quality of our researchers, will contribute uh, to, to to solving uh, all the uh, problems and all uh, uh, all challenges that uh, that we are. Face it. So I wish you all the best. I wish you all the best in the discussions. Uh, I hope uh, all the speakers will show up uh, at some point and uh, we will have a meaningful discussion here. Uh, and uh, the, the, clearly, like I said, problems, European problems, of course, there are many European problems that we have to solve. Of course, maybe it is hard to solve them uh, immediately. It's a process of, of discussing and is a, is a process of uh, obtaining uh, of uh, achieving uh, some sort of consensus on how to uh, how to handle uh, all the uh, all the issues that that arise. So uh, all the best uh, in your in your discussions. And, uh, I, I wish you a great two days of uh, of uh, uh, research and and uh, scientific uh, scientific communication. Professor Veressa, you have you have the floor. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I also would like to welcome you uh, at this annual conference organized by the German Economy Research Department at the World Economy Research Institute. Um, in fact, this conference is an annual conference, so every year we meet and discuss different issues. Uh, related to the um, Polish-German relations or development of Polish economy or German economy. So it's great that this year we can discuss uh, important problems that the EU uh, is facing. Uh, I think that the title of the conference Kovadis European Union is very right title uh, nowadays and very hot topic in fact because we are all uh, very interested uh, where we are going in fact and what kind of um, what kind of um, uh, aims and objectives we are going to fulfill uh, in the nearest future in particular um, taking into account the problems or challenges that we uh, have to face uh, like COVID crisis or some internal tensions or internal challenges um, which are related to um, different legal issues or some uh, external challenges like digitalization. So there are a lot of interesting topics that uh, we uh, will discuss during this conference and I would like to welcome all the speakers, uh, thanking them for their input and valuable ideas. And also, let me give a warm uh, welcome to our conference co-organizer, uh, uh, the Foundation, Konrad Adenauer Foundation, um, which supports these conferences since many, many years. Um, I know uh, that it's not only the discussion, but the conference is about the discussion, about the presentations, about the exchanging of views and maybe arguing sometimes. 
uh, but this conference uh, always brings uh, concrete results uh, as well. Uh, I mean the books, which are a result of the conference presentations. So uh, I hope that th this year there will be also um, uh, an opportunity not only to discuss uh, these important issues that uh, Europe uh, uh, should should somehow cope with, but also to uh, have the publication being a result of this conference. So we will not only have the live discussion, but also have an opportunity to read what researchers think about these difficult problems. Uh, so thanking again for the support to uh, Konrad Adenauer Foundation and um, thanking to the organizers for this effort because uh, I know how difficult it is uh, to organize the conference and uh, it seems that online it's easier, but it's not <laughs> because uh, you have to attract people with the topic. People are not that <laughs> interested to, to join uh, easily, uh, taking into account that we have a lot of events of, of this kind. So, so, so thank you for uh, this organizational effort. Uh, I wish you uh, fruitful discussions uh, uh, which go beyond Polish and European perspective uh, and German perspective because we still need to think also about European perspective uh, and uh, I, I'm really sure that uh, these uh, words, these discussions will lead to some um, preliminary solutions or recommendations also for policymakers how to uh, cope with uh, current and future problems. So welcome at the World Economy Research Institute. Um, many thanks for your input and I wish you fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. David Gregorz. Uh, you yeah, many, many thanks for, for the kind introduction, ladies and gentlemen. Also from my side, uh, from the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, a very warm and brief welcome uh, um, to all of you. It's good that we are looking at economic issues uh, again, and I'm extremely grateful that uh, to the co-organizers that we are discussing topics today and tomorrow that will be decisive for Europe's uh, future. The public debate in Europe in recent months has been shaped uh, by the pandemic, climate policy and foreign policy issues. And I believe we are not talking enough about the sources of our prosperity. Is our European market economy able to secure future prosperity? Can we do something to counter the competition with Chinese state capitalism and the American platform capitalism? How do we increase uh, innovation, competitiveness and the degree of digitization in the European Union? All of these uh, questions will be uh, uh, addressed uh, during the conference. And I think economics isn't everything, but without uh, economics, everything is nothing. So um, I wish us uh, fruitful discussions and I just got the uh, message from the office of uh, uh, Mr. Oettinger that he will join us in a couple of minutes because uh, he is uh, uh, in, a, in another conversation, but he will join us uh, uh, soon. So this is uh, maybe an optimistic sign at the, at the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is a very <laughs> good start for us now. Okay, then. Then we can, uh, Mr. Antosiewicz, uh, I think. Um, we, we can, can start. We yes, can thank, start. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor uh, Abilich. Uh, um, thank you very much for, for inviting all of us. I think that I, I'm speaking in the name of all panelists, this uh, panel discussion. Uh, but I don't know, if should we wait right now for Commissioner Ottinger or should we start the discussion? Or maybe uh, Commissioner Ottinger is already with us. Mr. Ottinger, are you mm -hmm. with us? Or maybe someone from his office, because uh, she should, uh, he should deliver the keynote speech at the beginning of the panel discussion. So we can start, no. of course. No, I'm. No. If if you don't have if you don't have an information how many minutes it would take time, then I would try maybe to uh, then let's to, to start with a warm up maybe, and then we can we can integrate and the uh, the uh, our keynote. Uh, exactly. If so I will start to. 
Yeah, I will start with a warm up question uh, to our two other panelists. And let me just introduce uh, Dr. Christian Rusha. Um, uh, uh, since 2016, he is an economist uh, in the digitalization, structural change, and competition research unit at the German Economic Institute in Cologne, Institut der Deutschen Wirtschafts uh, in Köln. Uh, but today I see he is in the home office in Bochum, uh, not in Cologne. <laughs> His research focuses on competition effects of digitalization with a special focus focus on data and the impact of digital platforms. Further research topics are Industry uh, 4.0, structural change, as well as competition law and digitalization. Hello, uh, Dr. Rusha. Hello, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a great honor and great pleasure to be here. Thank you. And it's a great pleasure for us that you join us. And uh, I want to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Edward Zinger. Uh, he's actually uh, now in Amsterdam, but usually he lives in Berlin. He's an entrepreneur, uh, co-founder Noizinger.ai, uh, uh, startup founder with over 15 years of uh, software development, corporate management, business development, sales and business process management experience. And uh, he represents uh, today uh, the Federal Association for Artificial Intelligence, uh, Künstliche Intelligenz Bundesverband uh, from Berlin. This is an uh, association with over uh, 300 member, members, and he's uh, head of the Finance and Insurance Working Group. Hello, uh, Mr. Zinger. Hello. Uh, thank you very much to, for having me here. Uh, let's. Uh, AI Foundation, German AI Foundation is uh, in Berlin, but I'm living in Frankfurt. Oh, so okay. that's also why uh, finance and insurance, because uh, Frankfurt is still kind of financial center, I suppose. So, and uh, yes, but thank you for the introduction, Mr. Andrasevich, Anton Se Antosevich. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's fine. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so we are really online, so we can be everywhere actually where you are. Uh, doesn't matter where exactly, Berlin, Frankfurt or Amsterdam. And uh, before we start with the keynote speech of uh, Commissioner Ottinger, let me ask uh, you a warm up question. As uh, Professor Billy said, uh, the European Union's GDP was estimated to be around 15 trillion dollars in 2020 last year. So I would like to ask you because our topic of the panel discussion calls impacts of artificial artificial intelligence on European economic development. So the question would be, how much of that GDP, the European Union's GDP, uh, is attributed uh, to uh, artificial intelligence? Dr. Rusha. I know they are not official uh, numbers, uh, they are uh, estimates, but uh, what are your estimates? Um, so I had a look at the, the numbers uh, one hour ago. So there are estimates for the worldwide turnover of product, software and hardware related to AI that go to around 380 billion dollars, so around. So when we have a look at the world GDP, that's more than 84 trillion dollars. That means AI makes up less than 1% of GDP. And I guess it also holds for the European Union. So. But that's so, only the turnover with products and software. Maybe the effect is larger because of productivity like gains yeah. and whatsoever yeah, on firms using that. But sorry, I, I guess that we receiving still the sound from David Gregor. Mr. Okay, thank you very much, <laughs> David Gregor, for turning off your mic. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Rusha. Um, so again, so. Uh, I estimate the rough products related to AI is less one than 1% 1 of GDP. And when we have a look at GDP and the 15 trillion, then we also have to say that China is also near 15 coming from below. So um, this it's China and the European Union are on one level and AI can be an opportunity maybe to stay ahead in front of China. So that's... But did I understand you correctly? So you're saying that less than 1% of the European Union's GDP, this is artificial intelligence, and is the same situation in China, this as well less than 1%? Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's exactly. even lower in China, I guess. So 
this is lower than in China. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Zing okay, Mr. Zinger, what are your estimates? The same, it's just like less than 1% of the European Union's GD GDPs because this is a very small number. Everyone is talking about artificial intelligence and you're saying this is done <laughs> less than 1%. Yes, um, I, um, I founded a study from year 2020 uh, made by ECO Verband, I think also from Cologne, and uh, they uh, said that um, that um, economic potential of artificial intelligence um, should allow to um, the growth of approximately 13 percent until year 2025. So means in five six years, so 2020 until 2025, they're talking about 13 percent. My understanding is through this five or six years, that means two to three person per year, maybe. I mean, I don't know how they calculate this. Yeah, but uh, but it seems like uh, we are still at the beginning, right? Um, y y yes on, uh, and no, no, because um, there are many companies already using artificial intelligence also in Germany or in European Union, but um, that's not so many as it should be, so to say. And uh, I think uh, we are in the beginning of implementation or in wide implementation of artificial intelligence. We are, uh, there are a lot of companies, as I know, um, middle size or big middle size companies and enterprise already using artificial intelligence, intelligence in some processes, also maybe using um, or starting with POCs with, uh, with proof of concepts. But until we come to the point that this company is also using artificial intelligence uh, on the wide range, it will take some years, I suppose. But uh, yeah. I see that uh, Commissioner Ottinger is joining us, but we have still a problem with the picture. So, uh, Mr. Commissioner, we see you not so clear, but we hope that uh, in a second it will be much better. Then just let me um, one follow up question to Mr. Rusha. Maybe we have still a problem with the definition of the uh, artificial intelligence uh, in the European Union and uh, worldwide. Uh, what is your definition of uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, yeah, you're, you're right. As, uh, as mentioned before, since 1956, uh, this term was coined. So uh, we are working on artificial intelligence since 1956. And I can also remember back to the 90s where a computer defeated a chess grand champion. So I guess Gary Kasparov lost against Deep Blue, I guess. I can still remember that. So we have artificial intelligence being a topic a long time ago, but they're still lacking a general definition. One reason is this because we have many applications that are based on uh, AI, for example, predictive maintenance, natural language processing or uh, smart manufacturing whatsoever. And what my understanding of AI is, and we can talk about this, you can also prove me wrong, of course, is that we have some kind of system that tries um, to get information on the status quo of uh, his environment, and based on this information, it makes um, decisions or even can do some action based on this information it gets, and that this um, happens completely automated with out any human involving in this process. So that's that is what I understand about uh, AI. So so it's taking decision by itself, not of course. without any help of, of, of human being. Um, uh, no help. Maybe there is some surveillance, maybe some human checking whether this is a good decision or not. But um, in its core, it's only the automated system making its own decisions and maybe also causing own actions based on the information it gets and maybe also on the information it collects on its own. Mr. Ottinger, do you hear us? Do you see us? Herr Ottinger, sind Sie da? Mm, I guess no. So, uh, Mr. Zinger, are you agree with this definition of uh, AI? 
Yes, in general, yes. Um, we have, we should uh, we should distinguish. I mean, uh, I mean, what we have today is a kind of uh, narrow AI. Yes, it's applied AI, so to say. And uh, what uh, uh, most people uh, thinking about uh, if they talk about AI, it's uh, general AI, mm -hmm. so the kind of Terminator, you know. But uh, this will come if uh, maybe in 20 to 30 years. And uh, what we have today is applied AI means that uh, what uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Rush already said, the possibility to solve uh, or to make some decisions uh, without uh, support of uh, human beings, but in special areas. So narrow AI means that's a special area, uh, mm -hmm. auto automated uh, uh, cars, for example, or uh, um, exactly. Or, uh, when you think about cars, Mr. Zinger, let's go to the car of uh, Ginter Ottinger. Hello, <laughs> Mr. Commissioner. Do you see us? Do you hear us? Hello. Good to see you. Meanwhile, I can see you and I can hear you. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Uh, I I don't know if you can if you can drive. Uh, probably you're not driving right now. Okay. This is very safe. So this is a good information. Welcome to the panel. We're very happy having you here, and uh, we very happy to hear your keynote speech uh, to our panel discussion to our conference. The floor is yours. Dear moderator, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let's see what is the state of play 2021. AI is a technological game changer and is changing all economic sectors, all industries and our whole society. Second point, Europe is lagging behind. We have a lot of potential. We have uh, intelligent people, but in comparison to California, the US in general, in China, we are lagging behind. What can we do? Um, I think we need a European strategy, not a strategy member state by member state, Poland, France, Germany, Estonia, but a European strategy. We have a European single market and we need a European digital single market, a common market with common standards and these common activities. In our European budget, we have Horizon Europe and we have Digital Europe. We can meet and we can use this amount of money, billions, for the support AI competencies in our universities, in our research institutions, and so on. We need a European network. Uh, not just the Polish network, not just the German network, we need a European network. We need um, collaboration of best IT specialists from all over Europe. So it's about research, it's about innovation, it's about European standards. And we need a smart public-private partnership, a partnership between our industries from the automotive sector to the manufacturing, to the chemical industry, to financial services and our public um, network and our uh, state-owned universities. We have to see uh, what are our European uh, competencies, where are they, which people, uh, which startups can uh, use. Uh, on our panel is the chairman of a, a German network. Um, I think it's great to have such an association, but we need it on a European level. We need a European AI association, uh, supported by member states, but supported by the European Union as well. And um, a last point is, we need a realistic outlook What's about AI in 2030, AI in 2040? We need um, a competent and excellent uh, analysis. What is the reality in our industries in eight and in 18 years time? And what could be done that we are not the loser of such a technological revolution? We are producing cars, we are producing 
uh, machines. We are producing chemical and pharmaceutical products. What will be changed by AI in our products, in our production, and for our services? So uh, a real realistic outlook and analysis. What will happen? What will be the future in our economies, our industries in 2030, 2040? This we need, and I think we have not really a clear picture how uh, Europe and our economies will be um, competitive in 2030, be competitive in 2040. So your seminar, your conference is just uh, in time. It's an important conference, and I think you should use this conference and the Adenauer Foundation in Warsaw and your partners, but foundation in Paris as well, in Madrid as well, and in Brussels. We should leverage your conference on a European level. We will, but we start in uh, uh, Polish-German uh, cooperation. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, thank you very much. You're saying that uh, uh, Europe is behind uh, the United States and behind uh, China. Uh, you have been, uh, you were European Commissioner for Digital Economy and Society 2014-2016. So what did you do wrong that we are still behind? It's about money. If you see what um, the US OTTs can invest, the first of all, Google Alphabet, but Microsoft as well, or um, even Facebook, they are investing dozens of billions of dollars year by year. And in our European budget, we had no financial program. Now we have it. It was my idea to create Digital Europe. It's about 8 billion. And to leverage Horizon Europe. And now we have two programs on a European level for to co-finance um, AI projects and activities. And uh, after the pandemic, we have next generation EU. My expectation to our member states and their governments is that they are using next generation EU um, partially for AI projects. So take the Polish government, hopefully we will come to an arrangement between the European Commission and your Prime Minister and your government. So uh, we can bring um, uh, many billions of euros from the next generation EU program to the Polish government and via the government to the Polish industries. We should use it. AI investments have to be a priority from now on. It was not a priority last decade. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, you're saying that um, there, are, uh, we, there are no single European uh, strategy on uh, AI. Uh, this is like on many policies that the member states doing uh, their stuff and the common institutions like the European C uh, Commission is doing their strategy. What is the, the, the biggest barrier to create one single digital or AI strategy? Um, uh, what is the biggest barrier in this field? Um, our smaller member states are not the problem. Estonia, Ireland, Portugal, Cyprus are aware that we need a European strategy. But our bigger member states, take Germany. Uh, in Berlin, uh, ministers are thinking they can create an own German strategy. And that's wrong. Same in Paris, uh, partially in Rome. So we have to convince our bigger member states that they're not uh, big enough, not powerful enough for to compete with the US and with China. It's a, a clear message from Warsaw or from, from my side to Berlin and Paris to accept that we have to be a European team, that we mm -hmm. have to create public private partnership on a European level, that we need business Europe on the one hand, the Commission on the other hand, and money for to invest.
Yeah, but why they don't still understand that? Because I think that we're talking about it for years, and Ang uh, Chancellor Merkel is saying that very often that uh, we are a very small uh, countries compared to China. And when you're still saying that uh, the problem are still the biggest, uh, the, the biggest member states like Germany, like Paris. So in the public, uh, they are saying something different. Uh, so why is that still the problem? Why they don't still understand that? They are accepting that uh, the EU has to play a role, but they don't accept that the EU has to play the central role. Uh, so we are on the way, uh, but they don't accept that Brussels is uh, the capital for AI uh, and the Commission has to be the driver for AI and no longer a German minister has to do so. I see. And uh, the very last question in that uh, part to you, Commissioner. Uh, we, have, uh, we have been speaking about uh, um, uh, the influence uh, of AI on the European Union's GDP. And uh, Dr. Christian Ruscha and uh, Edward Zinger, uh, they have said that this is less than 1% uh, right now. Are you agree with this estimate? Uh, uh, the impact uh, on the EU economic uh, growth uh, uh, in the European Union uh, of uh, artificial intelligence is so small right now, it's like less than one percent. Um, I don't know is it less than one percent, but it's not enough. It should be three, four, five percent. Um, and if you take Korea, Korea or Japan or the US, here uh, the influence and the part of the GDP is much higher. So maybe it be 0.8 or 1.2 or 1.5, it's not enough, it's, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Mr. Commissioner, do you have still 10 minutes to ask for us or you need to leave? Because I know that at 6 you need to leave, right? Yes. But we have still 10 minutes, then uh, maybe one more question to you. Uh, uh, generally speaking, how is European business already using AI in your eyes? Uh, you said that this is the problem with money, but right now, uh, how, how, uh, how would you describe the situation from the business point of view? How are they using uh, the AI? At the end of the day, it's about uh, CEOs to see and to know that they need internal AI competencies. Uh, take, I'm coming from Stuttgart, take Mercedes-Benz Daimler. Uh, since more than two years or three years, they have internal uh, teams, uh, engineers, um, scientists, um, people from the design side and they have IT specialists, specialists for AI. And so I think all companies, all mid-sized companies, all current players need um, coherent teams in which IT and engineering sit together. Uh, the way of mobility of tomorrow may be a car, may be a train, is uh, full of AI, has to be full of AI. So we need the combination of traditional engineers and of innovative IT presenters. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ruscha, uh, 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 do you agree with uh, uh, the judgment of the situation which uh, Commissioner has delivered uh, right now? And what's your point of view? How is European business uh, dealing with AI? How is using AI? Yeah, right now. Um, first of all, I have to say that AI has m many opportunities for European Union as a whole and for all the European companies. For example, with the help of AI, you can have um, applications that help to manage climate change, that can help to reduce um, this uh, CO2 gases. You can have also applications that help fighting the virus. You can also have uh, technologies that make um, labor and also make uh, the industry um, more, product, more productive so that can increase productivity. So you have many opportunities AI has for the European Union as a whole and for every um, um, enterprise. And we, we also yeah, had... 
what we know, but this is something what we know already. Uh, how they dealing with it? How, how they use uh, the mm -hmm. European enterprises? How they use right now uh, AI? So we had a look at the German um, enterprises, especially from the industry sector and from the service sector related to the industry, so something like architects and so. And we asked them in um, 2019 whether they use AI or not. And in 2019, they uh, only about 10.1% said that they were actually using AI or AI products. And we also asked them this year, and in this year, there were all over 20% from the industry and the industry related services that were actually using applications related to AI. So they see that they have many opportunities due to AI and they also start investing in, in AI. So this can have many different forms from um, uh, language processing or uh, chatbots or uh, also autonomous car driving. So we we do see that, especially in the industry sector in Germany, we have many AI applications. And I also made a study for the European Commission. And um, there, especially in, in, in Spain and France and, and the Northern um, countries like uh, Finland, and so they were very proud to using AI in the relationship uh, uh, with the consumer, so um, business to consumer, and in Germany is more a business to business topic. So we really see that they are working on this. Nevertheless, as Mr. Oettinger said, we are lacking some kind of holistic strategy for the whole European Union. I see. Mr. Zinger, uh, you represent here uh, the business. <laughs> so the same question to you. Uh, how is European business already using AI? Um. I can not say you about uh, you, but I can talk about Germany because uh, we are generally working in, in Germany. But um, I can say uh, following. Um, first, yes, uh, as I already said, uh, the German industry started or is starting to using artificial intelligence, not enough. Uh, I also uh, agree with uh, Mr. Oettinger that we need to invest much more money, much more money in in, in countries, but also on the EU um, level. Um, as I um, said to you, I, I was uh, between May 2020 and uh, July 2021 head of AI lab in Heidelberg. But, but excuse me, just just just, yeah. uh, just one question. You think we yeah. need to spend more money, but I guess that uh, some governments, like the German government, government, doing programs uh, to support entrepreneurs, like uh, for this is a program for five uh, uh, milliard uh, euro, but till now uh, um, it's used just three million euro. Zero. So you are not using this Zero. money. Three hundred, three hundred million from two point five. Exactly. So two point five. Yes, that's, why that's you true. Are, why are yeah, you yeah. not using this I money? mean, you should you should separate. The supporting of the of the state is something uh, uh, interesting in Germany. It's very bureaucratical, so it's very difficult to get the money. I mean, money is here. It's not enough money, but money is there. But it's and very it's difficult used. to get the money. It's not 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 used, but uh, uh, it's uh, difficult to get this money. So so what we need, we need less bureaucracy. So that's first. Another point, what I was talking about, for example, some. Uh, uh, states, I mean, Länder, Bundesländer, as uh, uh, Baden-Württemberg, they started uh, such uh, initiatives as uh, AI labs. We, we had 19 AI labs in Baden-Württemberg. Uh, I was head of one of them in Heidelberg, Kurpfalz. And our idea, our, our goal was to help a middle-sized business to understand what is artificial intelligence and how they can use this. Because Germany, okay. I'm, I'm talking about Germany, is very good in research, but not so good in is an implementation. What we need is this research uh, transfer from from uh, universities, from research centers into industry. And that's the main issue, one of the main issue, I think, what we have. And I suppose also on the EU level. 
Okay, then let's go to Commissioner Ottinger. So we have two problems. One of them is uh, the oldest one in the business and between the business and the state bureaucracy. So uh, how the politicians can uh, deal with it. And the second one is the research problem because I have from many people from Germany, especially uh, uh, one sentence in Europa wird geforscht, in uh, China wird, in, uh, wird umgesetzt. Uh, so it's like yeah. research is being done in Europe, in China. This is being implemented. So so uh, how can you reply on that, uh, Mr. Commissioner? We need more and deeper collaboration between industrial players, between global players, our big European um, companies and our research institutions, universities and our startups being there. So to bring together uh, startups and uh, young IT specialists uh, with our industries, uh, organized, uh, moderated by uh, agencies, maybe by a, a state-owned agency or a commission-owned agency, to develop a, a public-private network, uh, I think is the most important thing. The difference between the distance between universities and OTTs in California is zero. Uh, Stanford, Berkeley, uh, State University of California and these global players they are working together day by day uh, and non bureaucratic. And if I agree, for a startup, it's so difficult to become money from a German land or from the federal government. It's very bureaucratic. On the one hand, it's good. It's good against corruption. Uh, it's good against, against uh, strength investments. But maybe we have too high hurdles. And maybe we need, um, uh, we need people who are assisting and advising a young startup. If you are an IT specialist, if you are motivated to develop software, uh, but you are not really experienced to, f uh, to fill uh, uh, papers, uh, to uh, 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 analyze and to recognize uh, legal uh, obligations, uh, then you are demotivated, you are re resi resigning. So maybe we need some people, senior managers who are willing to uh, come together with startups and to advise them and to assist and to do this bureaucratic job for them. I see uh, one more question on competition. You said uh, that uh, we are behind uh, the United States and China. Uh, uh, how how far we are, how, how very behind we are. Do you believe that we can still win this race in a couple of years or or not? This is over. Uh, please be honest, you are not a politician anymore, Mr. Ottinka. No, I think there is a chance. The good thing is uh, the digital revolution is a new re revolution year by year and we can come back uh, into the game. And I'm sure our young generation is creative and we have good universities. Uh, we need more money, we need a better network, we have to work on a European level, we have to Europeanize our digital strategies, then I think uh, we have a chance to be one of the three important players on a global level. Great message. Thank you very much. It's six o'clock. I uh, think that you need to leave, but I see, Mr. Commissioner, that you spend a lot of time uh, in a car. I don't know if you remember that, but when when were you in Warsaw, uh, you were at that time a budget commissioner and you gave me one interview, but you said to me, I don't have time. You can uh, join me in the car and you can make this interview in the car. And we did that uh, from uh, the government's uh, uh, building to the airport. Thank you very much for the interview and thank you very much for today. And maybe one more question, because this is something what uh, we are interested in as well. Uh, Germany is creating the new government. This is still building. And one of the questions is very related to the to the car as well. Speed limit by 130 kilometers an hour. It's it's coming or not? It it's, will become? It's not coming, no. It's not a must. It's, for, it's not a must for the Greens. The Greens have some priorities and they need uh, a coalition agreement in which some of their priorities are. But tempo limit is not their real uh, major, uh, priority. And are you expecting that uh, AI will be a huge uh, chapter in the coalition agreement? I hope so. And I hope we will have a own ministry for digital um, politics.
Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Peter Ottinger, thank you very much. Gute Reise. Vielen herzlichen Dank, Herr Kommissar. Uh, thank you for joining us. All the best. All the best for all of you. And please call me when, when you need some more background or when you are coming to Brussels. I am there three days per month. Let's see together and to drink a cup of coffee or a glass of good French wine. Okay, on drive together by car. <laughs> it's possible as well. Thank you very much, That's Ginter right. Ottinger. So I think that, uh, Professor, we have, uh, I think, still 15 minutes. So uh, we want to make this uh, discussion uh, um, interactive. So if you have any question, please just raise your virtual hand and uh, you can ask your question and you can uh, um, uh, say your comment. Uh, it's very welcome. Uh, but uh, then maybe uh, the question to uh, uh, Mr. Zinger as well. Uh, because uh, um, you saying that this is still a problem as well with the it's a mentality problem. Uh, would you say that the European companies they are too conservative to uh, trying new things, to trying new solutions like AI? Um, I, I I still uh, don't want to speak about EU companies. I can okay. speak about German companies. German. Yes, they are very conservative, still very conservative, but not enterprise. I mean, enterprise uh, or big companies say usually very. They are usually very international, so they already learned how they should to move and to work and move forward. So, but uh, a big middle-sized company. That's a. I mean, that's a something what's very important in Germany. So uh, hidden champions. No, we have still many of them who are, which are still conservative and uh, which are um, not really aware and not very really understand why they should do something new because they did something for 100 years and this worked and that's uh, what they're saying okay, okay. We will do the next 100 years the same but it will be not so Trust but would you say is it a part of the problem uh, when we're talking about the race between Europe and China? Yes, for sure, for sure. We need to. Uh, uh, that also what I did in the last 15 months. I tried to uh, um, help middle-sized companies to understand what is AI, to understand if they need AI. I, I'm not saying that every company need to use AI. That's not what I'm saying. I I, I really trust, but it's something what every company need to check and need to understand and then to decide if they need to use new technology and one of the new technologies is artificial intelligence but if the companies decide to use artificial intelligence they need uh, support from the from the uh, uh, state from from uh, research and from other um, i mean also maybe a possibility to get some money for that but with any kind of infrastructure you know ecosystem what we also need. Also, maybe European ecosystem for artificial intelligence to support such companies, young companies, old companies, everybody, every company wants to move forward and to uh, work in artificial intelligence. Okay, Dr. Rusche, is it uh, the same, you have the same uh, judgment on that situation that uh, the companies in Germany, but maybe not just in Germany, in, in Europe, they are too conservative to win this race with China? Um, so when you say win this race with China, so have we lost the race with the US, right? So um, um, I don't know. This is a good so, question. What, what is your answer? <laughs> um, what I say is um, when we have so this general or, or let me start another uh, approach. So what we have is for example when we have at uh, uh, one example is the mp3 standards for music so it was developed i guess by fraunhofer in, in germany and then the big money was earned in the us so the reason is we in the european union we are very fragmented we were fragmented and um, it uh, there are much more opportunities to earn money in so big common markets like the US or China. So it so it helps for them applying the standard, maybe buying um, companies um, that improve standards or that develop standard, and then they can roll out and leverage this uh, on their big market. So why it seems to be uh, the problem in European 
especially also in Germany, is that we have, have many small markets where it maybe does not pay to, to develop or to implement such a new AI application. Those. So that's the thing what I see. What I also see, let me just one point, so uh, I don't want to stress your time. The point is, I guess we will have um, some kind of app store for every company. So there where big tech companies will develop AI applications that can be used by any business as easy as now on our smartphone. And th the problem what I see is that these big companies will come again from China or the US. So we need to have such kind of clusters that develop such kind of applications also in Europe. And therefore we have to uh, have funds, but we also have to complete this digital single market. So that's what I see is necessary to step up in the race. And um, Mr. Zinger, uh, on the website of your association, we can read uh, artificial intelligence is one of the crucial technologies of our future. The members of the German Association for Artificial Intelligence are committed to applying this technology in the spirit of European and democratic values and to Europe uh, achieving digital sovereignty. To achieve this, the Federal Republic of Germany and the European Union must become an attractive AI location for entrepreneurs where willingness to take risk is uh, appreciated and the spirit of innovation meets the best conditions. So this is exactly what you mentioned already and uh, what Dr. Uh, Rusha said right now. But I want to ask you again, what exact uh, conditions would you like? Uh, you said less bureaucracy, what more? Um, I mean, maybe we, we, we can, I mean, if we are talking about uh, um, startups yeah about startup companies and many of ai companies are startup companies and many of uh, many of members of uh, ai uh, association are startup uh, startup companies startups um, we need to understand that these companies are very flexible are very innovative but also very small and need uh, much more support as uh, as uh, big players so so what you talked uh, is right we, we need less bureaucracy we need more capital more money not only from state but maybe also from private investors we need uh, more uh, interaction with industry that's very important very important means that big uh, or uh, established companies are working with uh, uh, smaller with new innovative startups in the area also in the area of artificial intelligence and together achieve uh, uh, something uh, and we need uh, clear um, conditions, also legal conditions, and maybe not so strict conditions from the beginning, because we are now any in the phase concerns? of, I'm sorry. On, uh, any concrete on that issue, legal framework? Yes. Um, uh, what I want to say, because we, we, we uh, since, uh, I mean, um, some months we have uh, um, a kind of uh, draft of uh, EU, uh, AI um, legal framework. What is my opinion and the opinion of many of my colleagues is very restrictive and uh, imp also important, but it's not something where we maybe should start because other big players or our competitors, kinds of uh, China or US, they don't have such frameworks. Uh, okay, China is something else for sure but also us or asia countries or also uh uk still uk or uh, uh maybe uh, south uh, america australia they don't have such such frameworks that means that they are much more they can much more easier develop new products also okay. in the area of artificial intelligence and because artificial intelligence is very depending on um data Collection, we yeah. need yeah, on collection of data, on amount of data, on quality of data. We, we, we need to uh, um, understand that these legal restrictions will uh, bring us to the point that it's very difficult. It's possible. There are some uh, turnarounds how you can do this, but it's uh, po difficult to uh, get the data together and then to train the models and to develop new innovative products in the area of artificial intelligence. 
but the question of data is a question is about, about about uh, it's as well about our rights. So uh, how should the right. right balance look like between our rights, uh, uh, democracy, etc., and uh, yeah, a good uh, conditions for entrepreneurs? Are you using Facebook? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, we don't. Uh, I mean, uh, if you're using Facebook, uh, I suppose you read all the conditions and all what Facebook may do with your data. I don't think so. Uh, and uh, WhatsApp and everything. So people need to uh, first start with such uh, products if they're using them. Uh, then I don't really think that they have a problem with a private data. I, I see. don't know. Very good answer. So uh, before we coming to the question uh, of uh, Mr. Tom O'Donnell, then uh, let's ask Dr. Uh, Rusche, uh, what are your uh, uh, wishes for better legal framework? Uh, so what I see is uh, always bad for investments is uncertainty. Therefore, I hope that uh, we, sh we get, uh, based on the proposal from April, a legal framework that clearly states what is allowed and what is not allowed and uh, under which conditions AI applications may be possible. So in the last proposal, we have some kind of traffic light. So we have red that is completely forbidden. We have yellow that means high risk, special, have a look at it, special regulations on it. And we have this green light where we have um, not very much restrictions on it. So I like such a framework very much. And um, my wish is that we can construct it and make borders between the different colors so that we have a clear, distinct framework that everyone understands and everyone sees what is possible and under which conditions. And this helps also to foster um, investments. Dr. Rusha, but this is a very general wish. We wish uh, that for every law, <laughs> actually. Yeah, that's, what? that's true, that's true. Um, so, um, but what I also see, um, we have less laws regarding what can be done with data in China and the US. And therefore, where Europe can really make a difference is in this uh, data sovereignty and trustworthy AI that may be a niche market, a very, uh, interesting market and there this regulation can also help so maybe we are losing the match on general ai against china and us but in this smaller in this maybe more um uh, uh, more uh, important markets we can have and we can make a difference and there we can have um our competitive advantage so that's what i also see in this proposal I see. And uh, let's go to the question of Małgorzata Mazurkiewicz. I think that you can ask your question by yourself. Please uh, take on your mic and camera. We can see each other. And then we're going to a question of uh, Mr. Ordonal about the question of Małgorzata Mazurkiewicz is very connected to the last uh, answer. So, uh, Ms. Mazurkiewicz, uh, please uh, go ahead with your comment and with your question. Hello. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, Good to see you. Uh, for the start, I would like to, uh, to to greet you warmly today from Mainz and to say this is a pleasure to, to have uh, the chance to, to, to participate uh, in the conference. Uh, so thank you very much for, for that. Uh, I just wanted to, to thank briefly... You so much. And please, could you just very briefly introduce yourself? Very briefly. Uh, uh, very, very briefly, I'm the student. Uh, I'm a PhD. Uh, student of uh, Warsaw School of Economics. I'm uh, right now on the PhD research state in uh, Mainz and soon I will be uh, moving to Max Planck Institute of Competition and Innovation in uh, Munich. Uh, in, um, I'm going to spend there about one year and uh, when it comes to the questions, I just wanted to touch briefly the uh, the issue of uh, legal uh, the, the the legal aspect of European uh, Union. So my uh, um, um, 
Uh, as far as I know, uh, um, I've, co I've come across such uh, such uh, uh, opinion that uh, right what is happening right now uh, is that regulations become the main strategy uh, strategy of the European uh, Union when it comes to uh, in, uh, implementation of artificial uh, intelligence. So I think that we've already touched. Uh, so far, uh, the subject, and it uh, can be concluded uh, concluded that definitely uh, uh, regulations uh, shouldn't be the main uh, 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 the the, uh, the main strategy of European Union when it comes uh, to um, uh, artificial intelligence. Do you agree, uh, Mr. Zinka? I think that he's agree very much. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, for sure. Uh, uh, I, I agree that uh, the regulation is very important. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm initially come from the area of uh, IT security, and uh, uh, I I know uh, what, what is regulation, and I think in the many uh, areas it's also important. But uh, at the end, uh, I think in the in the Polish this 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 sprichwort so the not so the not to turn no exactly yes so. He, he, he can pronounce it very well because originally Mr. Zinga is from Ukraine, so this is the yeah. reason. Just telling uh, you. <laughs> uh, can you can you can you translate it to German? I, I mean, or to English? Uh, um, too, uh, something was too, too much is not uh, not good. I mean, was uh, exactly. was too feel was too feel is this not good? So that exactly. means that uh, maybe that will be maybe that will be in English less is more. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe. But uh, I, I I always saying uh, that um, good enough. Uh, that's something what we need. I mean, not always, not always. There are some areas I think that should be 100%. But in many areas, we, we, we need approach. And I think this approach uh, is uh, is using very good uh, by by US companies, uh, good enough. They, they're making products, they are good enough, and they sell they sell, they sell these products. And uh, what, what we do in Germany, we were trying to do this excellence. We're trying to do this 100%. What, it's very good, but you, as you know, the last 20 percent, the cost, the 80 percent of of the force, what, what you need to develop if you're developing a product. And um, I, I, I agree we need regulation, but uh, kind of a clever regulation. And uh, so then we need to go go forward. Yeah, but actually, maybe this is a general problem of the European economy, because maybe not the problem. Maybe this is, part, this is the part of the success that we are not uh, very flexible, but uh, 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 the quality is for us very important. So this is a part of the success, and uh, it has been the part of the success of the European economy, right? So let's go to the question. Thank you very much, Ms. Mazurkiewicz, for your question, and all the best in Munich. <laughs> Thank nice. you very much. And uh, let's go to Tom O'Donnell. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell, do you hear us? Do you see us? Uh, let's uh, ask you a question. Uh, okay. Can you turn on your camera? It's coming. How's that? Okay, perfect. Hello. Greetings from Berlin. Hello. Um, Please uh, introduce you, yourself very brief, briefly. Introduce myself. Yeah. Very brief. I, uh, I, uh, I teach here at uh, both at Freie Universität and uh, I teach at and I also teach at Hertie School of Governance. Um, I, I, I focus on energy and international affairs nowadays, but I'm a nuclear physicist by training, and I, I did some work in physics in uh, information theory. In, um, ah, what should I say? I won't try and tell you what it is, but it has to do with quantum computing and uh, incomputable uh, things. So anyway, I, I just don't get the discussion in Europe about these things. Um, it, it, it's like, uh, it's to me sort of a, uh, what should I say, it's taking place at a certain, and not at the proper level. If you look at the history of what happened in the United States, or actually for that matter in China, there is an academic base that has to be established. And, and also um, research, high, very high level research that's usually directed by the government and, at, at a certain scale. For example, I talk to students at the institute here at uh, TEU and uh, who work in information theory, communication information theory, PhD students. A couple of years ago, they were complaining there were courses they couldn't get because there's nobody to teach them. There's nobody qualified. And, uh, you know, somebody came from Israel, a certain professor, and everyone was excited. I went to my university and they were excited that they had a, that they had a new, uh, somebody new to consult with them. It was the same guy. I found him every place. <laughs> and the problem is there is a there's a problem with the level 
uh, the, and the educational basis. It's, it's, um, if you have people who do very good in communication information theory, they're stolen by the Americans, obviously, or someplace else. So that's one thing. And that can't take place. You need a certain centers on scale. And it can't really be done just on a, on a German basis. You need a CERN, something like a CERN uh, that's independent and has a big budget and, and uh, can bring in people and coordinate it. You'll never compete not only with the Americans and the Chinese, you're not going to compete with the Israelis um, or the Japanese. The other thing is, you will notice that in the United States, I mean, I, I used to teach about this, uh, the history of the information age. Much of the research that was done, uh, the beginnings of this was done by something like DARPA, which was this, you know, semi-secretive uh, organization. But behind the scenes, they developed, I mean, I know a bunch of the guys who, who were in this. They developed all sorts of things that now we think companies developed uh, that has to do with the Internet. And there's no equivalent in Europe. A serious approach, no disrespect to Mr. Oettinger. I mean, these are all necessary, but this is at a meta level. The base doesn't exist in Europe for the educational and institutional base for research. And that's what I wanted to, I'm sorry, I'm giving a speech. I wanted to ask Edward about this. Yeah, <laughs> Dan, let's go in a second to Edward, but one uh, uh, more question from me, uh, Mr. O'Donnell. Uh, uh, you are originally from the States, right? I'm just... Yeah, uh, yeah. I I'm just, yeah, I'm, <laughs> from <there>. exactly. <laughs> I'm just checking you on on, on the LinkedIn. So yeah. uh, tell us uh, uh, be, and be honest, uh, because you know we be hearing very often about the competition between the United States and China. And are you taking us seriously as a competitor in the states? Uh, I mean, us as Europe, the United States. That, yes, um, China does very well at some things. Uh, I have to say. There was a person high, there was high in the uh, uh, military, in the security apparatus who recently resigned, protesting that the United States is not moving fast enough at AI. They were in, interviewed in the Financial Times a couple of days ago. China is able to make some big advances. However, when you step back, um, the, the, I just don't know, it, it, the capacity of the United States is, is very large uh, it, and the bulk, the amount that's going on, it's very difficult to compete with. Even if you look at, uh, let's talk about chip production, which is a related issue. There's a hierarchy of where chips are produced. And yes, Taiwan, South Korea produce at a certain level and China at a lower level. But if you look at where okay. the means of production are produced, they're produced in Southern California for all that stuff. As long as you yes. have that hierarchy, the United States can stay ahead. Uh, and they're constantly struggling to do that. But if that's your question, uh, not really. So, but, but I think that you say that you. I think that you're saying that uh, you, uh, the United States is not taking uh, Europe seriously as a competitor in the field. Oh, I, oh, of, I, no, I'm, right? I'm talking about a real competitor, China. No, it's not. No. Okay. There's no. Look, you talk to students. I just okay. read somebody's thesis in information theory. You know, has to do with 5G and stuff, and immediately they have to look for a job abroad. They can't find anything serious here. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for, for your comment and for your question. Let's go to Edward Singer. What's your comment on that? Uh, yes, we need uh, more good professors and uh, uh, more good students, but uh, we have this issue not only at the universities. I have three kids. We have also problem to find good teachers. I mean, at the school, that's also an issue. And I think we need or we needed to find to start to solve these problems uh, 20 years ago, but we are late. OK, OK, we, we are need to fine. handle. We need to handle. Yeah, we, we all will, will die. It will die. Yes, but we, 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 all, we need to find a solution and situation we have today. And uh, uh, Tom, what 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 you uh, uh, said uh, <laughs> with DARPA? OK, maybe you want to say that we need as the European Union and Germany to have a bigger uh, uh, bigger military budget so that will help us to I mean I understand what you mean and that it's they're completely it could, coupled unfortunately they're coupled yes they're not that's true you can't do them independently and it's unfortunate I mean that's life right that's that's what uh, what you asked uh, trying to talk to your opinion you know since uh, 10 years <laughs> they okay. need a higher uh, military budget um I mean that's uh, partly uh, that's uh, I think uh, true because uh, I, I I am initially from uh, USSR, so uh, and uh, you know that uh, the the biggest uh, the biggest driver for innovation was uh, the military, 
because uh, that's why we have uh, so good uh, IT, also IT and mathematicians and physics uh, 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 people in, in uh, also in US, but also in USSR because uh, that was driven by uh, military um, innovation, so to say. Okay. Uh, I don't think that is a solution, but uh, yeah, that's that's part. But I think this is, for, for example, a solution as well in Israel, for example. But let's go to Dr. Uh, Rusha. Um, uh, why is that? And uh, is it a money question? It's always a question of money, and uh, economists would say. So, um, you know, what I see, especially when we have at the salary of professors uh, in Germany, they're really regulated. So, so everyone knows at the Beamtenbesoldung B or A15 or so. So we have regulated what's the salary. The problem is when you go to London or when you go to the US or even to Israel, you can earn much more. Oh, Therefore, Dr. Rusha, you don't want to hear uh, about Warsaw uh, level. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, uh, but, the, but the weather is lovely. <laughs> it's so, so completely right. We have problems keeping the top level researchers here in Germany or even in the European Union. And yeah, you're completely right. So, uh, uh, so a big demand by the, the government or by the state or by the European Union can help maybe to establish such kind of AI cluster wherever it is, could be uh, in the European Union. Um, it must not be a, a defense, maybe it could also be a, um, space research or it could be, uh, don't know, climate change research institutes where they use AI to maybe improve productivity, efficiency or something like else. So it can really help, as we were state by uh, both um, Mr. Singer and Mr. O'Donnell, that really a demand by the public side can really help to establish such kind of AI cluster here. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Billig is uh, chatting here time, so it uh, means time is up. Thank you very much, Edward Singer. Thank you very much, Dr. Christian Rusche. Thank you very much, uh, okay. uh, Professor O'Donnell. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mazurkiewicz. And uh, Professor Billig, thank you very much uh, uh, you. for your patience. <laughs> the floor is yours again. Okay, yeah, I think we have all, um, all together now enjoyed uh, our really, yeah, intensive and very fruitful discussion. Uh, our target for the day, I think, is reached, really. Uh, we had all panelists, we had intensive discussions, uh, we have new ideas and um, perspectives from different uh, now spheres of our societies. Uh, we don't have solutions, how to say, such prototypes of solutions for all problems. Uh, all the time, money is a problem, we know. However, framework conditions really, yes, I remember my, 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 my favorite example is the uh, Audi A, uh, A8 AI, yes, who was not, who was ready, uh, built and constructed from engineers, but uh, but legal framework was lacking and so far then they were putting it in the garage. Uh, I hope for other products uh, of our industry, we will find a better fitting between the product itself, physical, AI, and then of course also the legal framework. Um, I thank you all the, of the participants, uh, the panelists, the discussion, the, the participants in the participation in the discussion, Mr. Antoshevich, for this solid, reliable, and really, uh, yeah, <laughs> and then supporting and promoting uh, moderation here of the discussion. Um, we are a little bit late in time for the day, but we started a little bit later and so far we can say, okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish you, if you have a long way to home, I wish you a good way to home. Good evening. Uh, we proceed with our conference in the morning, next morning on Thursday uh, on 9.30 and so far. I hope uh, you will be uh, have you will have the time to relax in it during this time and uh, that we can meet in uh, tomorrow in fresh manner and physical status and, and mentality and that we can proceed in this way our discussions then and the on the second day of our conference. I invite you all. Thank you very much for the day for this evening. 